In this episode of the On That Net Show, we're going to have Jeffrey Fritz coming on to talk to us about some of the new features that are available today in ASP.NET Web Forms. Welcome to another episode of the On.NET Show, and today I have Jeff Fritz on. How are you doing, Jeff? Hey, it's good to see you, Cecil. So I'm doing Jeff, well. That's pretty good, man. So glad to have you on. So for our guests that don't know who you are and what exactly you do, why don't you give us a little bit about, you know, let us know what you do here at Microsoft. Sure, sure. So um, I'm a program manager on the .NET team. I'm focused primarily on community interaction. I do a lot of work with web forms and some of our other uh, web application frameworks. So um, I help coordinate events, speak at a couple of events. It's a pretty good time. That's pretty cool. So you mentioned web forms. And I know we have you know, ASP.NET MVC. We have ASP.NET Core. Uh, we haven't been hearing too much about web forms lately. Are we still working on that? Are we still creating, you know, doing more updates and releases for it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so web forms, right, that's the old ASP.NET, the, the ASP.NET we've had since the very beginning, right, where you have those ASPX files, ASCX user controls hanging out there. Well, we're continuing to develop and deploy new features for that with the system web capabilities, right, that DLL that ships with .NET framework that everybody has on their Windows machines. So. Um, it's a pretty complete framework, but we are making updates to make sure that it's easy for folks to use with modern web capabilities and to also give them some, some routes so they can take advantage of um, migration strategies to get into a .NET Core world if that's where they want to get to. Great. That sounds pretty good. So you're actually here to talk about some of those new features of web forms that we recently put out, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, th there were a couple of small things that we put out in .NET Framework 471, and we put out another one or two updates that are interesting in .NET Framework 472. So for folks that have the latest versions of the .NET Framework, you'll see these features um, both in your Visual Studio developer packs and on the server for you. Cool. Sounds pretty good. So, so let's talk about configuration builders, right? So that's, mm. I've seen some, some conversations about that and blog posts about it. But what exactly is it and what's the problem that it's trying to solve? Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a good question, Cecil. So what we ran into is um, particularly as we saw .NET Core be released, right? They've got this great configuration mechanism where you can layer your configuration, right? You've you've got several different configuration sources, and you can pull together the the unity of those various configuration settings and use that for your application. With .NET Framework, you can't really do that. You have a app config file, or you have a web config file that's hanging out there. It's XML format. And unlike .NET Core, you can't really get configuration from a third-party source and jam it into the configuration manager object without playing some games with, with those config files. So we wanted to make that easier. And particularly, we wanted to make it easier for folks to inject things like environment variables so that when they deploy their existing ASP.NET .NET applications into a Docker container, they can load up environment variables, they can load up Docker settings, or even pull settings out of an Azure Key Vault and inject them in and replace any settings that are sitting in there in maybe your app settings section or your connection string section so that you've got one configuration you're pushing around. Should make things a lot easier. That sounds pretty good. You know, I remember a few years ago. Um, you know, I, I was working on different projects, and you know, we had a similar concern where you know we had configurations that were in various XML files, and some of them were in databases and whatnot. And we had to kind of create these classes or these these libraries to kind of aggregate some of that stuff together. So it's kind of good to hear that you know we're going to get support for some of those type of scenarios that's just out of the box now. Yeah, and in fact, out of the box, we didn't define a specific provider for these third-party con uh, configuration settings. We actually only deliver with the .NET Framework an abstract interface, and we allow other folks to build providers as needed that they can add into your application. Well, you can add into your application sure. to enhance as you need be. So by default, we made a couple of NuGet packages available along with source code to do environment variables, Azure Key Vault, 
uh, JSON files, and even a user secrets XML file that we can hide elsewhere on disk, just like the user secrets feature that we have in ASP.NET Core. Cool. So do you have any demos that we can take a look at? Oh, absolutely. Have I got demos? <laughs> Let's get to it, though. <laughs> All right. And then you mentioned that this feature is available, this particular feature is available in 471, correct? Th this feature is available in .NET 471 and later. Okay. So you can, you can update your application to .NET Framework 471 and you can get access to this without changing any of your code. This is strictly a configuration file change once, once you do that rebuild with 471. Got it. So there are several configuration builders, like I mentioned, out there available on NuGet.org that you can download. And I want to show you two of them here. The first one is the environment variable uh, configuration builder. And if I take a look at my NuGet packages here, let's look at the installed ones named configuration builders. You can see I have Microsoft Configuration, Configuration Builders Environment installed, and I also have Microsoft Configuration, Configuration Builders Azure installed. Mm, okay. um, when I install those, it automatically adds a, a section definition to your web config file. It'll also do that for your app config file as well. And it will add a configuration builder section here where we define which configuration builders we want to load up and have access to in our application. Now, before I actually use these, let me just show you the demo page to kind of evaluate and show you what's presented. I have a default ASPX in this sample project that just does a for each through configuration manager app settings, all keys, and outputs the key and then the value that it finds inside of configuration manager. So this is, this is a standard API that we've had since .NET Framework 1 to be able to work with our configuration. But if I have these app settings by default here, you know, some service that I want to connect out to and some secret value as my service key, I can start to reference my environment configuration builder by adding this attribute to the element that I want to work with. Oh, so, okay. So I specify, we're going to modify this section with config builders, and then I give it the name of the config builder that I want to apply to it. So, so, quick, so quick question about that part. So, sure. so, so on line 15, I'm looking at app settings, and then there's a property called config builders, right? And you, you set it to some value. Can I yep. have multiple configuration builders in that property? Oh, yes. You can comma delimit these, and it will chain together from left to right the, the various values, adding on in just the same way that you do in ASP.NET Core, where last one in wins. Nice. So, oh, yes. Yes, yes. So let's, let's start with this. So I have these two settings here in my project. If I didn't specify a config builders argument here, these values would be output to the screen. But let's just start this, and we should see two different values pop up for my service ID and service key coming out of environment variables on, on my machine here. And there you go, right? Fritz desktop and then really secret key hiding in an environment variable so that no one can see it, right? That's They've the, been loaded, and I didn't have to make any changes, right? Nice. Um, and then the second one that I wanted to show is the Azure Key Vault feature. So we have Azure Key Vault that we can specify. I specified the name of my Azure Key Vault that's running out there, you know, in my Azure Active Directory. It's configured with a couple of settings. And because I'm logged into Visual Studio, as you can see up here, it'll use those credentials to connect out to Azure and access my key vault that has this name and fetch values from it. Now, now this one looks a little bit different from the previous one, right? So now this one now is taking some properties, right? It's taking a vault name and a mode. So I'm guessing right. as you're, you know, as the configuration builder is created, like you could specify, hey, I could add like some of these extra values and it'll kind of go in there to configure your configuration builder, so to speak. Absolutely. So if I had a JSON file that I wanted to load, I could specify that file name in the definition of the config builder here. That way I could load several different JSON, uh, JSON files as different 
builder entries here with the exact same syntax. But in this case, I'm passing properties of the vault name to connect to and this greedy mode. And um, this mode is actually a feature that many of our configuration builders have where we can say, make it strict where it'll only bring down values that match the properties that we're trying to replace. Or I can say greedy, which will go and get all of the values that are available out there and make those additional keys inside of my app settings. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm going to say, go get all of the settings that are available and let's add them and create new keys inside of my app settings. Got it. So I can switch to my Azure key vault just by making not that change, that change. <laughs> Don't paste it into the comment. <laughs> All right, so if I start now, it'll use, like I said, the credentials that I use to log into Visual Studio to authenticate and bring back my data for all of the keys that are defined inside of the key vault that I call Summit Demo. Um, and there you go. So I have the same right. service ID and service key, but it, it greedy connected my GitHub password and some other configuration information that's stored out there in my key vault. Right. Now, I might not use this in my application, but that's the purpose of Greedy is we'll bring everything back and we'll figure out what to do with it later. So That's pretty uh, cool. Uh -huh. So I, I like how easy it is it goes from, hey, let's, let's take some local configuration from my web config file. Then I can easily switch it to be like, hey, well, let's also include some stuff from my environment variable. So like now it's not in my project, but it's on the machine. And then you went even further now, right? You took it up to another level. You took it all the way up to Azure Key Vault, right? Which is like our secure um, storage facility, right? For some of these application secrets and, and keys and whatnot. Absolutely. And if, if you deploy your application then to app service running in Azure, well, if your app service application is authorized as an application in your Active Directory with access to the Key Vault, it'll be able to do the login and automatically pull down those values as well. So zero configuration, no, um, no secrets get saved to disk on your app server. It's just the name of the vault to connect to. And I think that's very important, particularly for, um, for source control purposes, right? Like I don't want to have to check in my secrets into source control, but now I can set up these configuration providers and instead I can get those values from somewhere else. And you know, I don't have to worry about sensitive information being stored in like my you know, my source control history. Absolutely. Saved on disk somewhere on a machine that's been decommissioned and somebody finds. Yeah, it's completely out of, out of um, any control that you might have on it, right? We're only accessing what we need. Nice. I really like this feature. Um, you have another feature too that you wanted to talk to us about, right? Yeah, so the other feature that, that we just recently added is dependency injection. Ah, so what is dependency injection? For all of us yeah. that might not know what that is exactly. So dependency injection is the, is the capability of our applications, of our classes, to have passed to them, passed in typically through a constructor, the objects that they need in order to, uh, in order to provide business value, right? Yeah. So, uh, for example, I have a page here, right? This is a normal system web UI page that has a, a product repository class on it. And it's, it's starting up. It's creating a new product repository. And then I'm using model binding in this method here on lines 22 through 25 to fetch data, fetch a list of products from that repository as a queryable object that the page itself will use as part of a grid view right there in the select method to populate the grid. Wow, so we and, have DI and model binding available now in web forms. Oh, model binding's been around since um, ASP.NET 4.5. So yes, model binding is very much available. All of our data bound controls have these um, method attributes on them like select method, insert method, update method, and delete method that are pointers in our ASPX files back to a method here inside of our, our code behind. Right. 
So no, with, with dependency injection, I mean, that's, that's something very common that we see a lot with um, our MVC applications, where our ASP.NET Core applications, I mean, oh, yeah. you know, to the point that it's actually baked in and it's a part of the core framework. So it's really good to yep. see some of these features now that are coming into web forms. Right, absolutely. And the, uh, this is another one of those features that, that's helping to, to give you the ability to do some refactoring now, push things like your, your database access layer out into a separate class library, have it injected at, at runtime so that it's outside of the web forms project and you can start to move that into perhaps a .NET standard class library where when you do your .NET core rewrite, you can reuse that code. Nice. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's stop talking about it, right? Let me, let me see how this works. Right. So I have, um, I'm newing up a product repository here, but really what I want to do is pass that in on a constructor. So I'll use the CTOR snippet to generate my constructor here. And my, my product repository implements the I product repository interface, and it returns just a, a pair of nonsense product objects that return the names foo and bar. Yeah. So let's bring in an I product repository here, I product repository, and I'll just call it repo. And I'll specify that this repository is that repository class that was passed in, and I can get rid of this initialization here, right? The the phrase new is glue, right? Is something <laughs> that, that we're familiar with, right. where by putting a new here, we're, we're tying that implementation of a product repository to this class. So this changes things to make it a little bit more loosely coupled. Right. The last piece of this is we actually need to, to connect this product repository object to a dependency injection container so it knows how to turn this request for an I product repository interface into a concrete product repository. And I have that over here in my Unity config uh, class. So I have a simple configure method here that creates a new Unity container and it registers the type I product repository should deliver a product repository. Got it. The, that's garden variety Unity container configuration, but this is the glue here. The web object activator is a new Unity config. It's a new one of these things. Yeah. Now, web object activator is an I service provider that you need to implement if you're going to go all the way down and create one of these classes for your favorite uh, dependency injection container. Right. The one method you need to implement is get service for a given type, return some object. So all we're doing is saying, look at that service type that's requested, which will be this page. And then we're going to go down and say, look at the constructors. If uh, the constructor has parameters where all the parameter types are registered in our container, Resolve container. Go build me up one of those things. In this case, my default page. Okay. If we can't do that, then we're just going to do a standard activator create instance of that object. Now, what's great about this is I'm not coupled to just a system web UI page. This also works for user controls and other custom controls inside your application. Got it. Does that also work for handlers and modules, per se, if I wanted to do oh, the yeah. other those? Absolutely. It will work for ASAH, ASHX files. It will work for ASMX files, right, your SOAP services. Um, so you have a, um, a, a simple implementation that works really across the entire system web base framework, right? Nice. This doesn't work with MVC where you're building up controllers there or web API. That, there's a separate configuration for those things. But this will get you in with that base level of system web capabilities. Nice. So uh, let's fire it up and just show that it does, in fact, return our object. So what I really like while well, that's booting up, what I really like about this is, so to just register it, all you need to do is just assign it to that web um, object activator and then the system will just automatically pick it up. Like I don't have a separate thing I have to do in global.asax or anything like that. Like it could just kind of right. happen in that space. 
It just happens. We load up and I got my two product products coming back inside of a very simple grid on the default page. Nice. So, right, it, the the idea here is to make that re-architecting that, that many of our customers want to do of their applications so they can consider a .NET Core, a .NET Standard Class Library, make that easier to do by allowing you to refactor and take advantage of modern dependency injection capabilities. Nice. So, if I wanted to learn a little bit more about this feature and, and also even the um, configuration builders feature, like where could I go to kind of get some reference material and maybe even see some samples about it? Sure. Um, let me go to. I have a, a um, blog post here on the ASP.NET blog. If you go to blogsmsdn.com/webdev, this is called "Use Dependency Injection in a Web Forms Application." Go ahead and check this out, and there's another sample here that you can see that shows you how to upgrade to .NET Framework 4.7.2 and apply these uh, these changes and take advantage of dependency injection with Unity. For configuration builders, there's an entry in the docs at docsmicrosoft.com, and if you, if you look up the configuration builder class, there's a complete article here about how to write your own configuration builder, as well as how to do the configuration inside of your web config or app config class uh, file, and then links to our existing configuration builders that are available for you on NuGet. And just like the dependency injection stuff, like both of these should be pretty easy to create my own if I wanted to, right? Absolutely. Um, I've taken some time and I've built my own configuration builders to read from things like an INI file, right? Those any files that that people loved so much before Windows 95. There's still a bunch of them out there, and people like to be able to read from those as well. Nice. So that's one option. I even wrote one to read from like an RSS endpoint, right? So you could publish, you know, here's the configuration that I want on a web server somewhere as an RSS file, and be able to read that in and configure your application from a central location like that, off server entirely. Right. So. Pretty so, interesting. So if I have an existing um, Windows Forms application and I upgrade to 4.7.1, do mm -hmm. I have to do anything special? Do I have to pull in any packages or should these features just kind of light up and be available for me? Um, if you upgrade to 4.7.1 with Windows Forms, you will need to, um, to update, to install those packages for configuration builders and update your config file. Now, Installing those packages doesn't mean you need to recompile. You just need to get the DLLs into the bin folder with your project. We'll, um, we'll use Reflection to load up those capabilities. Write it application startup and apply the configuration to your application. Cool. Well, this is awesome, man. Like, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about these features, Jeff. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the time to, to share these features with, with folks that are interested in, in modernizing and taking advantage of some of, these, some of these capabilities that .NET Framework hasn't had until recently. Yeah, this has definitely been awesome. And cool. so, this, so this has been another episode of the On.NET Show. Thank you all for watching.